After two weeks of both me and Paul alluding to it, we finally hear his specific concerns for the Colossian church. And I admit that this reading from the Colossians is not nearly as exciting as the lesson from Hosea, which I will have to preach on in three years, Uh, nor sassy Jesus talking about giving your children stones and scorpions. But Paul writes out of concern for the church, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy or empty deceit, According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. As Paul writes to the Colossians, he's not worried about them using their brains or thinking. He's not worried about them logicking through problems and finding good solutions. He is, however, concerned that they're letting things get in the way of our Christian belief that Jesus is both fully God and fully human, and that through God's acts of redemption in Jesus, we have been reconciled to God and called to restore all people to unity with God and one another through Jesus, the resurrected Christ. Paul is writing to a church that was rooted in Jesus, but found new teachers whose talking points seemed to make more sense, seemed easier to follow something more difficult. Paul is telling them that while we explore our reality with the depths of our knowledge and lived experience, there are times that things just won't make sense. So we follow this wandering rabbi, starting with our central claim. People don't come back from the dead. And yet we believe that Jesus did. God is God and we are humans, but we believe that in Jesus, God continued to be God while also becoming fully human. The church does not believe that a good man is taken up into deity, nor a charade by which the earthly Jesus was only God role-playing as a man. And it's okay to struggle with these things, to struggle with a God who cares about us at all, to struggle with the idea that God gave up all of that to be one of us. I have a two-month-old, and being one of us is gross. Paul isn't saying just to let things be, casually, easily, blindly accepting them. That's not his rebuke of philosophy here. He does, however, caution against those in writing to this church at Colossia who offer new and improved ways to encounter and experience God. Some of these new and improved ways, like the belief that matter isn't real, or that disease is simply separation from God that we've somehow caused ourselves, aren't even new. The idea that bodies are bad or not important is exactly a notion that Paul was combating, including with the Colossians. He says, philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. These are not deep thoughts about the nature of goodness or pondering how to live an ethical life in an interconnected society with variables significantly beyond our control. These Philosophies and empty deceit are a rejection of some of the bolder claims about Christianity, the claims that bring us freedom through Jesus rather than having to appease the God of fires to keep our air clear this summer or the God of the wind to keep the fires on the other side of the state if they come. 
Those are the elemental spirits these teachers have been telling the Colossians about. And Paul wants to bring them back to the idea that through Christ and Christ alone, Christ fully, we have freedom. Starting with Jesus becoming fully human so that we fallen and broken creatures, so that this earth that we inhabit could be sanctified by Jesus being with us and drawing us back to God. Second, Paul wants them and us to remember that in Jesus' full experience of death, death he willingly died out of love, death has been defeated. It has no victory and the sting of the grave is gone. Additionally, as Paul explicitly says today, when you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Throughout this letter, Paul has not held back his critiques and concerns, but throughout it, he has been positive and affirming. He loves the Colossians, and that comes through so strongly when we read this letter. He also doesn't want them to think that they need to worship or pray to river spirits or angels who have part of God's divinity alongside Jesus who has only a part. No, Paul says, all rulers and authorities of the world were created through Jesus. Through Jesus' resurrection, the rulers, the powers, and principalities have been shamed because they couldn't hold him down and brought into submission. As N.T. Wright says, death is the last tool of the tyrant, and it has no hold on Jesus. Because of this, Paul commends the Colossians, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. That's Paul's call for us, too, to continue to live our lives in Jesus, the resurrected Christ, trusting that in the speck of time we're here, God is working and active in the long game, actively working to restore all things and build up Jesus' ministry of resurrection and reconciliation. Rooted and built up in Jesus, established in the faith, and abounding in thanksgiving. You're going to hear those words a lot in the coming months. As we abound in thanksgiving and begin our fall pledge campaign, as part of our year-long, lifelong stewardship efforts, you're going to hear rooted, built up, and established. We as a community are rooted, built up, and established. As stewards of this place and these resources, I hope we stay that way. I certainly don't think we're being called to move to some other location or disband as a congregation. Those thoughts are, I don't think are in anyone's minds. So abounding in Thanksgiving, we're going to embark on a mini capital campaign. If you were at the annual meeting or looked at the documents for it, you may recall that we adopted a deficit budget of about $30,000. Much of that deficit is a result of necessary maintenance that has been minorly deferred, not so much that it's become a major liability yet, and we'd like to keep it that way. When we adopted the budget, we planned to use $15,000 from savings that we have for capital improvement. We also planned to match that with a special appeal that I'm soft launching today. Paul's language of rooted, built up, and established said, now's the time, Joseph. 
So there will definitely be more information coming. A letter, an email, maybe a slick video. Someone in the congregation has skills for that to help. It's not me. But there will be more information about this $30,000 or so improvement campaign. And it will be very transparent, which is why we haven't said anything until now. We needed numbers. Where's this money going? What are we doing? We're going to paint the church. We're going to replace broken gutters. We're probably going to wash the roof. Rooted and built up in Jesus, established in the faith, and abounding in thanksgiving. Churches, congregations have life cycles ebbs and flows, as all organisms do. And as we find something like COVID normal, new paths are opening for us, and we have opportunities to grow in God as we're rooted and built up in Jesus, established in the faith and abounding in thanksgiving. Of the $15,000 that we're hoping to raise separate from year-round stewardship, we already have $3,000 or so given or pledged just for that. There have been some additional big gifts that the Bishop's Committee has slated for that as well. We're still keeping our goal at $15,000 to start. Jesus has overcome all the powers and principalities of the world, and this mini-capital campaign isn't going to make or break anyone's salvation. Buried with Jesus in baptism, we have arisen to walk in newness of life, regardless of how much we can or cannot give to this effort. And writing into the Colossians, Paul wants them to succeed in sharing the good news that they've found in Jesus. That Jesus is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and to those in the tombs, bestowing life. The good news that God made us alive together with him is news the Colossians know. When God forgive us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. We've been forgiven, and death is not the end. That's as good a news for us as it was for the Colossians, and it's good news that I want us to be able to share and to keep sharing long into the future as this body within the body of Christ. So as we look to the future, let's remember the good news and live our lives rooted, built up, and established in the faith. Amen.